Father God, we thank you for giving us this evening, Lord, where we could get together and just talk about uh, your word, Lord, things to learn from your word. Help us, Lord, not to repeat the mistakes that your people have done in the past. Lord, open up our hearts and open up the borders, Lord, since people are coming into our country anyway. We pray, Lord, that we might be of use, Lord, and help out, Lord, especially Ukrainian nationals, Lord, that are fleeing right now, Lord, refugees that are coming in, Lord. Help us do what you would do, Lord. You would not turn away from a Samaritan. You would not turn away from a hurting uh, uh, Pharisee. You would not turn away from anyone, Lord. You would, if they approached you and asked, Lord, if you're willing, you would say, I am willing, and you would extend your hand and touch people's lives, Lord, and do whatever you could, you could for them, Lord. You would do miracles. Well, Lord, here we are as a people, and we want to not let these moments go by. We don't want to just be taking in stats on our TV, Lord, of what's going on. Lord, can you use us? Use us. Send us, Lord, or bring them, Lord. Plant them in our backyard, Lord. Let us do whatever we can, Lord, to help in Jesus' name. We know the time is short, Lord, so help us do it for your honor and your glory. And pray these things again in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, good to be back with you. Been gone a couple of weeks uh, to, uh, well, a couple of Sundays anyway. Uh, I didn't teach on Sunday a couple of weeks ago on purpose because I wouldn't be able to teach second service and catch up, and I don't want to have them mixed. So I came to church. I did announcements and whatnot, and in second service, right after announcements, I went out the door, hit to the airport, hit it, and I was in Florida that afternoon uh, for a tremendous, tremendous teaching Calvary Chapel Pastors Conference, the Southeast Pastors Conference in um, Florida, uh, Merritt Island. Merritt Island is next to Cape Canaveral, and uh, we actually got to see on Monday morning a rocket taking off from Cape Canaveral. First time thing on my bucket list. I've always seen it on TV, but I've never been there or seen it go and then separate it and let poof, poof, uh, a plume of, plume of smoke, and then the rocket kept going until you can't see it, and it's quick. I mean, it's quick. Also, I'd never been to Cocoa Beach, where I got, was able to one afternoon, just one afternoon in Cocoa Beach, but I was able to work on my tan. Can you tell? No, because I'm Hispanic, and I was born this way, right? That's why you can't tell, but it's a great, great feeling. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them to Jeremiah chapter 42. Now, I want to welcome all of you. Glad that you guys are here this evening. It's not freezing cold. You're here. And for those of you guys that are listening on radio or watching on YouTube, welcome, welcome, welcome. You're part of the church. And uh, uh, some of you guys are sick. Some of you guys just can't get here. I understand. But I want you to know that you are part of Calvary Chapel Montrose. We consider you part of our family. So write to us. Even if you're somewhere uh, far, far away. I have a friend, uh, as I shared with you, in Gig Harbor, Washington. And uh, uh, he uh, uh, is listening in. And, and uh, it's just kind of neat to connect with him. He just sent me a pen a pen that has a crown on the top and has like a, a crucifix on the side. And uh, it, it's uh, uh, just like a Christian pen. And I didn't know this. Uh, he was also in the military and uh, he became disabled, but he didn't want to, he started wanting to do something with his life. So he now uh, creates these pens, uh, novelty pens, if you may. And uh, I know we can get the ones from the bank free, but but these are nice pens, and, and uh, he, he sells them to different countries. And different countries pick them up from him because they have uh, some great uh, things on them, whatever that country wants. Anyway, welcome if you're watching tonight as well. All right, we've prayed, and now I want to just, uh, uh, what we learned from chapter 41 so that we can uh, uh, pick it up where we're at. So remember, our, our title has been uh, Tragedy Follows Tragedy, and it's a series, right? So we've done part one, last time was part two, and, and tonight we get part three. Now listen, if it's a series regarding tragedy follows tragedy, it's only because we the people, or they the people then, did not like, oh, 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 I better correct my life, right? And tragedy will follow us, if we also don't wake up, hear the word of God, and be obedient to the word of God, and no matter what is going on in our world, that we continue in the things of the Lord. That's, all, that's on us, guys. It's up on us to be obedient. And, and you see later on that obedience to the Lord pays off in a blessed life, and the Lord lets us know that. So what did we learn from 41? Real quickly, seven months, 
Seven months after uh, Gedaliah, the governor of Judah, whom the King Nebuchadnezzar had appointed, seven months after he was warned by Johanan that Ishmael was out to murder him, it happened. It actually happened. Gedaliah was murdered at a dinner party and uh, where his invited guest, one Ishmael, of course, indeed murdered him. What did we learn? Hey, if people warn you that someone's out to get you, kind of look over your shoulder every once in a while. You know, call Bob and, and Ted and the security team to kind of watch over you or something that's going to happen, right? It's up to us to listen, weigh it, and then an action, hopefully a, a very fruitful action. And we believe that this could have been prevented, but he did not pay attention. Gedaliah didn't. Ishmael, we learned, also murdered all those people that were participating in that dinner party to include the Babylonian soldiers whom Nebuchadnezzar had left over Gedaliah, who he had made governor. So seeing that, since he murdered everyone else, church, we learned that Ishmael truly was a very wicked man. How many of you guys know that there's wicked people out in the world? There are wicked people out there. How many of you guys know that there are wicked people in Montrose? Yeah, we have them also, so, so don't drop your guard. Now, we learned also that 80 men had come from different cities, from Shechem, from Shiloh, from Samaria, and they were coming to uh, the house of the Lord. Uh, so they're going to offer these sacrifices. So Ishmael, he went out to meet them, the same murder guy. He went out there, and he went out there with crocodile tears, and he was crying, and, oh, yes, well, Babylon has done all this and done all that, and they, they've, making, they've taken uh, Jedaliah and made him governor, so let's come in. And once he gained their confidence, do you remember what he did? He started killing them. He got up to 70 out of the 80, killing them. The last 10 said, dude, we have treasures of food. Now, why would food be a treasure? Uh, you ever been to Walmart when they're out of everything? <laughs> Well, so food at this time, especially after a war has taken place, a big siege has taken place, uh, it was the, food was a, a very precious commodity. And this, these last 10 guys said, don't kill us, man. Don't kill us. We got treasures of food hidden out there. So we learned because Ishmael did not kill them, spared them, that this is not only an evil man, he's a very greedy man out looking for himself. We learned that... Uh, Ishmael carried away then captive. He took everybody that was left up in Mizpah and took them all captive. Uh, and he was headed over to the Ammonites, right? Uh, and the Ammonites, it's not so much that the Ammonites were Judah's enemies. They just hated Babylon. And now uh, uh, Judah, who has been all the, almost everybody, Daniel and the rest of the gang, they're out going to Babylon. They didn't want any kind of allegiance to Babylon. So they're, they're getting the, 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 the Jews who are saying, we got to serve the Babylonians. God said to serve them or else we'll starve or we'll do this or that. Let's trust the Lord. They didn't want any of that. So they're going, they went out to the Ammonites. That's who they were. Then we learned that Johanan, right, uh, when he heard of what had happened, what Ishmael had done, that dirty rascal, right, he raises up a fighting force. He goes after them, went after Ishmael. He got to all the people. He winds up freeing all the people. So he did a good thing. He freed all the people, right? But Ishmael and like eight of his guys, they got away, and they went over to the Ammonites. So finally we learned that Yohanan took from Mizpah all the rest of the people that were there. And remember, we're talking about a remnant that is left. Remember the poor uh, that the, the Babylonians did not take, the ones that were alive still because they killed many, right? They took group over to uh, Babylon, those that were left, uh, Johanan took them from his spot, and he's heading down, and he's by Bethlehem now, and he's heading to Egypt. He's heading to Egypt, um, uh, so we're talking the mighty men of war that are left. He's taking moms and dads and their kids, uh, and he brought them uh, again uh, close to uh, uh, Bethlehem, and the reason he's heading to Egypt is because he feared that the Babylonians or the Chaldeans, after they would hear what uh, Ishmael has done, are going to come back, that army is going to come back and completely annihilate him. So he's looking for safety. He, they're looking for no war. They're looking for food. They're looking for this and that. And they think they're going to find it in Egypt. 
How many of you guys know that it's a bad thing in the Bible to head back to Egypt, right? You need to know this. In the Bible, going back to Egypt, desiring the things that are Egypt is always a thing. It's always looked at as you and I going back to our old ways to make a living. You and I going to the world. You and I giving up on the things of God, not trusting God that he's going to take care of us in the midst of whatever. And we're returning, and it's really returning to your old ways, your own ways, and not the ways of the Lord. Not a good thing. So when we hear that Johanna, he rescued them, oh, that's a great thing. And now he's coming down, uh, and he's headed to Egypt. You want to go, ah, oh, dude, why are you doing this, right? And so here's where uh, we realize Right in a series that we have, a tragedy follows tragedy. Uh, it happens when people do what they think is right in their own heads and in their own hearts, and they stop following the word of the Lord. Uh, it happens to an individual, and it happens to a nation. Listen, tragedy follows the tragedy when an individual or a nation one depart when they depart. From following the Lord. If a nation departs from following the Lord, as America has, we could expect tragedy. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of time, right? The Bible says it's going to happen. These are uh, principles that are true. It's going to happen. When an individual, a tragedy follows tragedy, when an individual or nation disobeys the word of the Lord, and we as a country, as a whole, have been disobeying the word of the Lord. We murder babies. We do all kinds of weird stuff, right? We lift up homosexuality. We uh, lift up all, all kinds of weird stuff in our world. So, you know, God doesn't turn a blind eye to that. And that's a nation. But how about us as individuals? As individuals, we're supposed to be serving the Lord. You get tempted just as anybody else get tempted to do goofy things. Don't go there because if you're disobedient and you're not following the things of the Lord, tragedy is going to fo follow. You know, right now they're uh, just discovered or realized that a bunch of Navy guys <laughs> Uh, officers are in big time trouble because of some of the deals that they did in in giving over private contracts to uh, uh, to uh, contractors, and it's in the millions. And there's just now another thing that's happened in our military. Not a good thing. Anyway, uh, tragedy follows tragedy when an individual or a nation turns a deaf ear to those whom God uses to call one or a nation back to the Lord. So. Keep it in context. Jeremiah has been talking to the people. Guys, what are we doing? You know, this was going to happen. It happened. And now there's a remnant left. There's just a few people left, considering all the ones that, that have been killed and taken away. And he still calls them to come back to the Lord. And if people ignore that, as we're going to find out from Judah what they're doing, uh, tragedy is going to follow. So for us, when God's word is very clear, and you decide to do your thing anyway because, and you justify it with ABC, you can't expect good things to happen to you or your life or your loved ones. You can't do it. Uh, it's up to us as individuals, especially these guys had heard from the Lord. You and I as individuals, you who are listening on radio, watching on tube, we have heard from the Lord. And if we choose to do our way, we didn't learn anything because tragedy will follow tragedy. I don't know if you guys are aware of families that have gone from one bad thing to another, and it's just heart-wrenching what happens to these families. And at one time, they were walking with the Lord. At one time, they were one of these kids going up to Sunday school, learning about the things of God, and they let those things uh, just go. Uh, when individuals or nations leave the things of God, tragedy follows, and it's not a good thing. And now, church... We are ready for the rest of the scripture. Amen. So here we go. Part three. Tragedy follows tragedy. Verse one. Now all the captains of the forces, Johanan, the son of Korea, Jezaniah, the son of Hoshaiah, and all the people from the least to the greatest came near, verse two, and said to Jeremiah the prophet, please let our petition be acceptable to you and pray for us to the Lord your God. For all this remnant, since we are left but a few of many, as you can see, that the Lord your God may show us the way in which we should walk and the thing we should do. Man, doesn't that sound great? Like a repentive group of people now. 
Well, let's make some observation. observations. Observations. <coughs> From verse 1, we learned that everyone came to Jeremiah. Everyone is represented here. The military leaders are the people from the least to the greatest. And there's an application for us that just jumps out of this. And, and, here's, what, and here's what it is. When we are not sure of our next move, when you are not sure what happens when you get the pink slip at work or you have your landlord says, dude, you got to leave or, or whatever. When you are not sure of what you're going to do next or you feel threatened because of events that have happened uh, in our lives, we should seek the Lord for his wisdom and his leading. That is a good thing to do. And we see here the remnant comes and they find Jeremiah and they're asking him to do these things, right? So it's, it's a good application for us to do that. Listen, position in life or station in life does not matter. You will come to a point where you have to make a decision. Seek the Lord for wisdom. This is the picture here. They're coming to Jeremiah, and they're seeking the Lord. They're wanting this wisdom. Yesteryear, they came to Jeremiah the prophet to hear from God. Today, you and I go, number one, to the Lord. We speak to him as our friend. We speak to him as our God. We speak to him just in conversation and say, this is on my heart, Lord. I'm not sure what to do. I got kids that are depending on me, a wife, a mortgage, a truck payment, whatever. Lord, I need your help. I really need your help. We always come to the Lord and we speak to him, or as we say, we pray to him, right? Then, so number two, we go to his word. Try and find a devotional that is specifically addressing what you're going through. There are many men and women that have written tremendous devotionals or devotions. And we are rich in these things, but we don't go into the treasury of God's word, God's people, uh, getting advice from those that we know are walking with the Lord. And it's to our bad that we don't do that. We should be doing that when we're in a pickle, when we need some help from the Lord, when it's something that I'm just not sure. I need advice. I need some help. And you go to God's people. We turn on Christian radio. You'd be surprised how many people do not go to Christian radio. And I know sometimes K-Wave is touchy-feely and stuff like that, but man, thank God for their the presence all over the world. But every once in a while they say, which one you going to get number 99? 99 goes on. I was so broke, I didn't know what to do. And you start weeping on the radio, you know, because there's true stories. They're, they are, you know, and, and they're put there. And, and so, you know, if you like touchy-feely, go to K-Wave. It's great. There's a lot of great teaching radios. Hello, how many of you guys have ever heard of 100.9 FM? Raise your hand. Oh, thank you, especially my station manager. That's our radio. We broadcast from upstairs. We hit all the manchos, and I've told you we won. I mean, we've been licensed now to go to the big step, class three, the next level for radio, and we're going to hit all these areas and communities around us as well. And so, yeah, we go to Christian radio. And we learn to sing with those songs. How many of you guys know all the K-Wave songs? Raise your hand. You know them because they've been playing them a hundred times over all the time. So you should know them by now. But for those of us that don't, it's because we refuse to learn these new songs that are snappy. You know, or, or whatever. And that's on us. Listen, if you want to hear Bringing in the Sheaves, you know, find a turntable and some of those old records, Right? Uh, you can't find 8-tracks anymore, but I just have discovered, because I moved my mother-in-law. She's living with us now, thank you, Jesus. But she has in a box, almost like the day she bought it, a, a uh, what do you call those? Uh, it's, it's a VCR. So it has those, like, 8-track tapes. You know, uh, what I don't know well, what those are. But, yes, there's still things around, around. But here's the point. God made you with round hills. Everybody check your hills. See if you have round hills. Does anybody have square hills around here? Nobody has square hills. So what are the round hills for? So you can pivot with the things that God has brought in technological-wise. You need to pivot with the new songs. But I don't want to sing those songs. They just, I don't get them. Well, excuse me, you know. In the 20s, they didn't get your songs from the 40s. You know, I, they just didn't, right? It's up to us to say, Lord, if this is what you have, help me make my life open to you, you know. We need to be people that can pivot and accept the things and the technology God has put in our hands. Not to do so is you plateaued. 
you just plateaued. When you have that attitude, you plateau. God wants you to be growing, growing in him, growing in wisdom, growing in everything he has. And when you say, no, put on the brakes, Lord, okay. And have you guys seen those lines in the hospital? What does it mean? You're dead. You're dead. God can't use you anymore because you put on the brakes. Be open. There's nothing like a grandparent or an older person, right, sharing with the young kids things that they could use and things that they didn't know. Right, and even getting techie with them, you know, and even explaining the things. Most of our kids today, probably most of you guys today, never remember the tubes that they use behind radios and TVs once upon a time. And you have to pay the electrician guy or the TV guy to come over and, and, and 25 bucks to change a tube. And you tell them, hey, that tube, come on, that's not worth 25 bucks. It's of course not. How much is that worth? About a buck 50. Why are you charging me 25? Because you've got to put it in and know how to kick the TV, and there it goes, and it went on again, right? That knowledge. We have knowledge to share with our younger kids. It's, an up, it's up to us to find a way to engage them and help them. I love what John and Sarah is doing with the youth group. Did you see half the church vacated right now when they went upstairs? We have a window of opportunity with these kids, and right now, I'm telling you, get involved. Be involved in one way or another. Invest in these kids because before you know it, your 401K is going to zero or they're going to freeze our assets, you know, or, or, or it's gone. And all these little things you're planning on retiring on the earth, yes, have a plan. Don't go nuts and be broke on everything. But at the same time, how are you using all your resources? You know, do you have suburbans to lend to the kids or, or parents? Are you willing to drive them? Are you willing to take a trip here or there? Think about ways to be involved for the kids. It's, it's a blessing to you. Uh, and, and it's a blessing to the Lord. Uh, so you should know those kind of things. All right, where were we? All right, so from verse 1, the application, we got that, right? God speaks to us through his words, up to us to uh, pray with him, talk with him. We turn on Christian radio. Uh, we can read specifically, like I said, on uh, something that addresses what you're going through in a devotional book or something. The point is that we do something instead of nothing, when you're faced with a situation, do something. If you just stay there and say, well, it's going to pass, it's going to pass, and six weeks go by and it hasn't passed, maybe the Lord wants you to get other people involved and be praying with you and specifically go after that. All right, so something about wisdom, if you did not know this. Listen, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. James 1, 5. I love James. He's such a a practical uh, uh, apostle, he was, right? Great guy. But did you read that? You should have your Bible highlighted or underlined with a pencil or, I don't know, some kind of mascara thing or something like that next to it. But you should know these things, that when we are lacking, the Lord invites you to come. And what does he say? He gives to everyone liberally, right? He gives them liberally. Observe, church, that uh, from verse 2, that they began their conversation with Jeremiah, God's representative at the time, with the word, please. Here are these people. They all came, all ranks of life, military, regular people. They came and they began their conversation with Jeremiah with the word, please. Quote, let our petition be acceptable to you. Church, listen to me. If your mom or dad did not teach you manners or how to humble yourself, or you just didn't pay attention when they tried, learn here from the Bible. The Bible is the greatest educational book in life. It will share with you. It will tell you. And if you have an open heart and open spirit and you're before the Lord, Lord, uh, as they used to say in Kentucky, I want to learn something. You know, you need to learn. You need to understand this. And some of us perhaps didn't have dads or moms. Some of us perhaps we were hard-headed and just didn't understand do you want to pay attention to that? But learn and see what God does, how people humble themselves. Listen, these people that are coming to Jeremiah, they knew that God used Babylon to conquer them. They already have that in their head. They know what has happened now. They didn't want to believe it at first, but now they accept it because it's past tense. Secondly, they knew that they had chosen to listen to the false prophets who kept saying, no, God will never, we have the temple here, we got this and that, God will never allow these heathens to come and take over us. His people, they knew that. 
But there's not one prophet around right now. Not one of those false guys are around. They're either dead or they just went into hiding, right? They didn't listen to Jeremiah. They knew that they had offended God and they had offended him. They knew that they had offended God by completely disregarding his commandments, and they had made idols for themselves. Every house had a little idol, and they were praying to them and fashioning them and doing these kind of things, and they worshiped them. It was a big no-no. They know the Ten Commandments, right? They knew that. They knew that they had done much, much worse, too much to mention here, but now they knew, they realized they needed God's help. Listen, you got to get there. If you're not there, I don't know what else has to happen in your life and you finally come to your senses and say, I need God's help. There is no way I'm going to make this, make life on my own. I need help. So they humbled themselves and began their conversations with, please. That's a good place to be. And sometimes we say, well, I'm going to have to eat crow. Dude, learn to eat crow. You know, humble yourself. Learn to ask. Because if you don't, you just make it harder on you and your family. And there's no out. There's no out on this. Something we learn about humbling ourselves, again from James chapter 4, verse 10. The Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. It doesn't say he might lift you up. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he may lift you up. No, it doesn't say that. My Bible doesn't say that. Uh, possibly he'll lift you up. No, it doesn't say that either. Either, right? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So you think about this. In the sight of the Lord. God's watching you. God knows you. God knows your heart. God knows your hardness. If I'm going to humble myself and he's looking down, I can't fake it. It has to be a real deal. I need to really, I don't know how you were raised. I was raised in a little Pentecostal church. And I'm telling you, when the pastor finished preaching, he says, come and pray. Everybody went forward and prayed. All 22 of us whole church right the the point is we came down to an altar and we prayed and people wept and cried and people got saved and and so very early on i knew that when i'm before the lord i fall on my knees i get it and i'm on my knees and i'm open-hearted before the lord and i'm having a conversation with the lord and the lord the lord's seen and when i've done my bads and god knows i've done many bads and i humble myself before him i know he hears and I know he forgives. Each and every one of us, he forgives. He sees us. That's why it says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And I'm not talking about anybody else, nobody else. But God sees me. God watches me. He watches over me. And when it's time to get supernatural help, guys, we got to come to him. There's no one else that can help us in that. So, yeah, for sure. If you are here or listening again on radio or watching uh, on the tube. And if you know you have been on the outs, as we would say, with the Lord, uh, not his doing, but yours, uh, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Note his word again. He will lift you up. There's not a maybe. He will do it. From verse 3, it says, I want to make, from verse 3, I want to make two observations with you. Okay, number one. They want God to show them the way, so that's spiritually. They want God to show them the way that they should walk, it says, right? So that's spiritually. And sometimes you need to learn the ABCs of how to please God. You have Ten Commandments, you know, so you need to know those things. That's how to walk spiritually before the Lord, right? And church, they need it and, and, want, they need it and want, want it direction. <clears throat> and so they're coming to Jeremiah. Again, if you need to return to an authentic spiritual walk with the Lord, um, or perhaps to start one, maybe your walk with the Lord isn't spiritual at all, right? Ask the Lord first, and then trust him to lead you to someone here that can help you. Our older brother or sister in the Lord, I don't mean necessarily in age. You hang out with each other. Iron sharpens iron. We're having breakfast this Saturday, right? And our whole theme is always men helping men. And listening to a devotion, if we're in a place that we need help, iron sharpens iron. Let's help one another out. And here it is again for us, right? So ask the Lord first, and then have him point you to someone that can help you if, if you don't have a clue how to get there. But the second observation makes me a little sad. 
Uh, even today, people don't realize this great, great truth. And notice in verse 3 that they address God as Jeremiah's God, right? They're addressing him as your God. They say, the Lord, your God. Had they never heard that they were God's chosen people? You know that they have. You know that they have. They know they're the Jews. When they needed to pull that trump card, hey, well, we're God's people. They knew that. They knew that. Of course, they had, but it becomes obvious, obviously that they had no personal relationship with the Lord. And that happens to Christians all around the, the world. They say that they're Christians because they were perhaps raised in the church, baptized as babies, this or that. So they say that they're Christian and such a big encompassing word. But you look at their lives and you really wonder, you know, where did they get their Christianity from? You know, when there's no relationship, you start talking about, well, you're God. I'm coming to you because you're God. There's no relationship. Church, I pray that you realize that the God of the Bible is your God. Not just Jeremiah's God. He is your God, right? If you have accepted Jesus, God's son, as your Lord, his heavenly father is your heavenly father. You need to know that, right? You need to hang on, the, on to this truth, and you need to own it. Your conversation with God is from a personal relationship. I come to you, Father, and then all of a sudden it hits you. Oh, my gosh, you created this and that. You've been around. You know, it humbles you automatically. But Jesus bridged the way that we can talk to the Lord, Father God, and we could talk to Jesus, and we can talk to the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we talk to all of them at the same time. No big deal. No one's keeping score or minusing scores in heaven. Conversation is what he wants straight from your heart. We should know that he is our Lord, not just Jeremiah's, right? Four, then Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard. Check this out. Indeed, I will pray to the Lord your God according to your words. Your petition, guys, it just didn't go one, through one ear and out the other. I've heard you, and I sense you are sincere at this time, right? So according to your words, and it shall be that whatever the Lord answers you, I will declare it to you. I will keep nothing back. From you is what Jeremiah says in verse 4. Church, true servants of the Lord, like Jeremiah, and most of you, I pray, take the petitions of others, especially your brothers and sisters in the Lord, right? Uh, and we go directly to the Lord, and you should do that. And if you can do that when they're asking you to pray for something, if it's possible to do it then and there, do it then and there, right? If not, as soon as you can, Get it done. Go before the Lord and take those petitions to the Lord, right? Uh, and there's no harm. And I know you say, but, but I have a relationship with the Lord. Can I go? Yes, you can go. But you can also go with others. There's power in prayer. And there's power in, in many others helping you pray over something. It gets things done, right? Someone, there used to be a song that would say, faith is the key to heaven, but but." Uh, no, prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. And so you going to brothers and sisters to help them pray with you and be praying for you, no harm done. It is a good thing to do. Again, I would encourage you to get it done when you can or as soon as possible, lest we forget. And you're telling people, yeah, I'll pray for you. Mm -hmm. And then you forget about it. Have you ever thought about that? How many times have you said to someone that I'll pray for you and you forgot? That's not a good thing. Learn to discipline yourself. If you give someone your word, stay with your word and pray for them as soon as possible. It's the best thing we could do as Christians, being praying for one another. Verse 5, so they said to Jeremiah, let the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not do according to everything which the Lord your God sends us by you, whether it is pleasing or displeasing, in other words, whether it's good or not so good. We will obey the voice of the Lord. Listen to what they're saying. We will obey the voice of the Lord, our God, to whom we send you, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord, our God. Boy, that's a lot of words, is it not? Listen to me. Be careful that you're not using a lot of words. 
in too many words there is sin. And if you're making all these promises, if the Lord does this, then I'll do that. And if the Lord does that, then, oh, I'm going to do this. And, you know, years ago I watched the movie and, uh, with um, Burt Reynolds and he's drowning. And he says, oh, God, please, this miracle. If you could get me into shore, you know, I'll do it, this and that. And he's starting to get closer. Well, Lord, you know, this is a pretty good deal. But if I get any closer, then, and he finally gets to shore, hey, Lord, thank you. And he takes off and back to the same old, same old. May that not be us, right? If you say, watch your words, Lord, I'm, then fill in the blanks. This is going on with me. Doctor said I have whatever. But Lord, if you touch me, if you heal me, I promise you that I will, and you make a vow to the Lord, watch your words, because he is listening to you. And he's going to perhaps grant you your request. But then if you fall back on that request, you better come before the Lord in a humbled way saying, I'm sorry, and let's try again, Lord. Can we start again? How many of you guys believe in second chances? Most of us have received them from the Lord. But every time, you know, it's you that will get a hardened heart and the enemy ever so on you. Um, why go back to him? Why go back to him? He whispers in your head. He's not going to forgive you. It's a lie of the devil. I want you to know that, right? But he whispers in, and we begin to harden our heart and we begin to lack in faith. And that's not a good thing for us, right? So be careful. And by this I mean choose your words wisely because God listens. I'm not telling you not to do that. When I first heard something like this, I said, well, then I will never make a vow to the Lord because I don't want to break it. No, that wasn't the teaching. The teaching is understand that you're talking with God Almighty and understand that he listens to you and understand that if you're in a pickle, he's going to help you get out. He will help you. But remember your vows to the Lord and complete them. Get them done, right? Seven, and it happened after 10 days that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Church, how many of you guys think that 10 days is a long time? Forgot to answer, right? 10 days is a long time. How about 10 minutes at McDonald's waiting for your, you know, they got two lines and they still take 10 minutes sometimes, right? Man, that's a long time. Yet, we need to become a people that is patient. We need to learn patience. Listen. The number 10 is used 242 times in the Bible. 242 times. The number 10 seems to reflect God's authority or God's governmental affairs as he rules over the affairs of men. God uses 10, right? Uh, it's been well said that if mankind kept the Ten Commandments, if mankind kept the Ten Commandments, right, we would discover that we would not only get along with one another, but we would be pleasing to God. And those are just the Ten Commandments. There are tens all over the Bible, and it is amazing how you see God's authority in it. It is just an amazing thing, right? So after ten days, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. You think God couldn't answer in one day? Of course you do. Of course you know he could. He could answer right now. But sometimes it's time passed to test you. Are you serious when you're asking the Lord, I need a new job, or you just want more money because you just want more money? Are you serious when you're coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, could you ABC, you know? And are you serious, or do you forget about that request in 10 minutes? 10 days is time I, and the Lord's letting it go by, perhaps to see what's really going on in your heart, right? Eight. Then he, Jeremiah, he called Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people from the least even to the greatest. Church, note here that Jeremiah called for all those that had called on him to seek the Lord. He didn't leave anyone out. That's the point here, right? Observation. God answers all who call upon him. God does answer, right? Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is wait. Wait 10 minutes or wait 10 days. The point is we have to wait on the Lord. And he's watching us. Second day, did we already forget? Are we going somewhere else? Are you looking to someone else for your help? Are you really sticking with the Lord? Sometimes it's a lesson for us. 
So God answers all that call upon him. And so once gathered, verse 9, he says to them, Jeremiah, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your petition before him. If you will still remain in this land, then I will build you and not pull you down. And I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I relent concerning the disaster that I have brought upon you. Oh, this is pretty powerful stuff here. Church, note with me, number one, the conditional clause, we call it. If you, right, here it is on you. If you, then God will. It's called a conditional clause in a contract, and we see it right here. See, God wanted them to remain in the land. If they did, God would bless them. He says, I will build you up, cause them to lay down roots in the land, right? He would not hinder them. In fact, he would relent. What does that mean? He would make a complete U-turn on the disaster that he had brought upon them. What was the disaster? Babylon come down, you know, the famine, the, the this and that. God re would relent. First time he says it here, I will relent from this stuff. This is a, a big deal. If you do this, God promises good. And, man, you can take that to the bank. If he says it, this is a great thing. And you know what it means to, to let, cause you to be planted and not plucked up, right? That means that you'll see your kids grow, get married, and have, give you grandkids. You'll have the second generation, perhaps even the third generation coming after that. God will plant you. He will not pull you up out of the ground. If you, then he will. And he says these things. These things that have come against you, couldn't get the job, couldn't get the car. All of a sudden, now you have the nice job and got a promotion. All of a sudden, they're calling you, and someone has a great deal on a truck or a car or a van or whatever it is. God will do these things. Uh, we say, man says, I don't say, I tell my family don't say this, good luck, bad luck, that's the world. You're either being blessed or you're not being blessed. If you're not being blessed, get back with the Lord and find out why. Maybe you're waiting those 10 days or whatever. But people say, oh, man, you're so lucky, this and that. You know, all your kids live here. You do this and that, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. I am blessed because my wife and I chose to be obedient to the Lord. And we can see now the blessings on our kids. This is what he's telling to each and every family back then and for you today. He wants to let you know you continue in the things of God and watch what he's going to do, right? 11 says, do not be afraid of the king of Babylon. <gasps> Who told God that, that they were afraid? Listen, do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Do not be afraid of him, says the Lord, for I am with you to save you and deliver you from his hand. And I will show you mercy, that he may have mercy on you and cause you to return to your own land. Wow, church. We learned from our last chapter that Johanan had led them close to Bethlehem. He was leading them towards Egypt because of the fear of the Babylonians. And I believe that in those 10 days, while they awaited for God's answer, God was tense, testing them. He was testing them. Those 10 days could have been used in prayer and fasting. Lord, whatever Jeremiah comes back with, Lord, whatever it is that Jeremiah comes back from, Lord, give us strength and give us courage to receive your word and have an I can and I will do attitude. Help, help us have that attitude, Lord, that we're going to do exactly what Jeremiah says is your word. But we don't read about them fasting, do we? We don't read about them seeking out the Lord. And it's to their shame but it shows you again, they did not have that relationship with the Lord. They didn't call him their God. They're not seeking him out. Remember, show us how to walk. We don't know how to walk. Spiritual walk, you should know that if you really are looking for God's answer, you should probably fast a couple days and seek him out and get the stuff of the world to quiet down in your life. Sometimes you need to get away. Sometimes you need to go and, 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 uh, on a trail or go camp. Or take your car for a long drive, just you and the Lord and the radio and the, the Word of God. Sometimes you need to get away. Shut the world down. And that usually comes about when you're fasting. And fasting is not just waiting for you to have those hunger pains. I'm not going to eat a double cheeseburger. I can't. And then two minutes later, oh, it smells good. I just passed by McDonald's. Why did I go this way? You know, whatever. When you're fasting, your stomach will go, mm -hmm. And that should remind you, you are fasting. 
Learn to control and discipline your body. Learn to do it. You know, especially if you're seeking the Lord, there's something really important to you. There's something that you've got to have an answer. You need direction from the Lord. Learn to spend time with the Lord. Ten days? I don't know. But for this case, it was ten days, right? They could have been praying, but we don't read about it. A few verses ago, we read that they never owned that God was their God. I shared that with you as he was Jeremiah's. And again, when there is no relationship or knowledge of God, there is fear and doubt of one's future. And you start trying to work things out with your intellect, with your mind, and you're blind to the things that God has for you if you just wait upon him. Church, God had revealed their fears and promised them good, even to relent from the disaster that he had brought on them. But they, and no one had told, you know, Jehanan had not told Jeremiah, I'm afraid that the Babylonians are going to come by and take us, you know, punish us for what Ishmael did. But the Lord revealed it. You know, this is why you're, why you're running to Egypt. You're scared, dude. You're scared of that army man, the Babylonian. I will change things around for you. I will change their heart. Do you know that God can change people's heart? God changes people's heart. He created us. He could change the heart. And if he says he's going to do peaceful things, he's going to do it. It's up to us to embrace that. But here's the other half of the coin, the other part of the conditional clause. If you, right? But if you say, we will not dwell in this land, disobeying the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, no, but we will go to the land of Egypt where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor be the hungry for bread. And there we will dwell. See, God is revealing what was going on in those 10 days of their hearts. They weren't listening to the Lord. They weren't asking the Lord. They weren't asking God for strength. They weren't asking God for patience. They weren't asking God, Lord, help my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. You don't hear of none of that. But what you do hear revealed is what they were hoping for. It says, if you do this, then hear now the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. Why remnant? Because it's just a few of them left. Thus says the Lord of hosts, God of the armies, right? The God of Israel. If you wholly set your face to enter Egypt, or if you surely set your face to enter Egypt, and go and dwell there, then it shall be that the sword which you feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt. You see, for God to, when that great hound of heaven comes after you, I don't care if you're in Egypt, I don't care if you're in Timbuktu, or as Job said, if I hide in the cave, there you are, or if I go somewhere else, you know, there you are. You know, God's going to find you. And if he says, if you go to Egypt, if you go find a place in Egypt, you enter those gates, I will overtake you there in the land of Egypt. The famine of which you were afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there you shall die. Remember, the country has been ransacked by Babylon. The summer fruit was there, but the fruit's going to rot. It's time to plant. It's time to get back, work the, the soils, and get those plow going and start uh, thinking about fruit and food for the near future. God said, I will bless you if you stay in the land. But if you look at it like it's too much work, if you look at it I ain't going to whatever. There's a better plan. I'm going to, grass is greener on the other side. I'm going to go to Egypt. And the Lord says, I'm coming after you. I'm coming after you. And those things that you feared the most, those things I'm going to use to overtake you. Right? This is what he's saying. 17, so shall it be with all the men who set their faces to go to Egypt to dwell there. Okay. So I'm talking to the leadership, but now I'm talking to everyone, everyone that's there. Any one of you guys, you're part of your remnant. If you go to Egypt, you can expect this to follow you. So now you have to be an individual and say, I'm going to either serve the Lord, trust him, or I'm going to follow the crowd. And I'll tell you what, you've never seen peer pressure until it comes to that. Follow the crowd or stand up for the word that has been revealed to you. God had revealed to them that his, his, his protection, his care over them. God had revealed it to them. But now turn your back on that and go to where everybody's saying, no, let's get out of here. Watch what happens. You know, 
If you stand, God will bless you. If you don't, you're giving it up. You're giving up the blessings that he had for them. They shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. The bugs are going to get you. And none of them shall remain or escape from the disaster that I will bring upon them. Again, God, who said in a moment ago, I will relent from what I've caused because of your sins. Now he says, if you, after hearing me tell you and promise you these things, you go forward, I will bring them upon you again. 18, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as my anger and my fury have been poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Remember, Babylon came down. They took them out to Babylon and uh, uh, Everybody that was left killed so many, burned the place down. He says, as my fury has been poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so will my fury be poured out on you when you enter Egypt. And you shall be an oath, an astonishment, a curse, and a reproach. And you shall see this place no more. When you want to come back, it ain't happening. And when people say, uh, uh, you're going to become a no. People would say, hey, I don't want to do that. I, you know, remember what happened to the, those guys? I swear it will happen to you if you follow those people. You'll become a no, right? An astonishment. These people who knew God didn't even know they was their God, and they disobeyed him again after they saw everybody marched off to Babylon and the other one's dead? Again? They do the same, and now they run the opposite direction? A curse. Hey, man, I don't want to change. Don't be my neighbor. Yeah, but I'm one of those Jewish people. Hey, don't get even close to me. You go camp somewhere else. God is mad at you, boy, for what you did. I don't want you in my neighborhood. Go to another neighborhood. No prison in my backyard, right? No this and that in my backyard, right? That's what's going to happen. And reproach, and you shall see this place no more. Church, in their 10 days of waiting, God here reveals again what they had been thinking about, what they had been worrying about. All they had to do was trust uh, trust him after he had revealed their fears and trust him, but their faith in him, put their faith in him and he would bless them. But to hear and know, then refuse, man, their worst nightmares would be realized. And that's what happens. And it's the same today. God has revealed to us eternal life through Jesus Christ and eternal damnation for those who do not place their faith in God's Son, in Jesus, right? He will get us through whatever hardships come our way today. Even if the, the war was here, the Lord would get us through. One way or another, God would help us out, right? He would plant us today, right? He would bless us. He would resurrect us if we died or if the rapture would take us. He would take us because we have not been appointed to wrath. Church, wrath is coming to this Christ-rejecting world. It's coming as he brings forth tribulation to his people, the Jews, so that they will return to him, right, or suffer the consequences. God's message was clear, and now Jeremiah shares his word, for God allowed him to see into the people's heart. So he says in verse 19, The Lord has said concerning you, O remnant of Judah, do not go to Egypt. Is there any part of that you do not understand? Isn't it clear? Do not go to Egypt. Now certainly that I have, now certainly, no certainly, that I have admonished you this day. In other words, I've warned you, right? For you were hypocrites in your hearts when you sent me to the Lord, your God, saying, pray for us. Pray for us to the Lord our, our God. And according to all that the Lord your God says, so declare to us and we will do it. And I have this day declared it to you. But you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God or anything which he has sent you by me. So what did the Lord do? He revealed to Jeremiah the heart of the people and what they were going to do. So he's hitting them before it ever happens, right? Now, therefore, know certainly that you shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence in the places where you desire to go to dwell. God showed Jeremiah. He showed him that they had decided to do their own thing. It only took 10 days, right? He gave them time to think about it. He gave them time to repent from those dirty thoughts, those horrible thoughts that we get, those ideas that come up. He gave them time to think about it, right? And I think you can pick up his tone, which was pretty direct, that reflected his feelings in all this when Jeremiah speaks to them. Bottom line is it would not 
go good if they did their own thing. It would end great if they obeyed God, whom they had known. But for them, tragedy follows tragedy. What a sad, sad thing. Tragedy follows tragedy. As we close here. For those of you who have not accepted God's word, right, that eternal life is in his son, that you uh, too will be found guilty as the remnant of Judah, whom Jeremiah pronounced divine judgment, if you do not accept his son, if your sins are forgiven, um, you have an opportunity today, right? If you're listening on radio or watching on YouTube, if you haven't humbled yourself, you know. So I say to you, humble yourself. Ask God for forgiveness, repent of your sins, and ask Jesus, God's Son, to come into your heart today while it's still today. Or else, tragedy will follow tragedy. Father God, we thank you for your word. We ask you, Lord, that we would be your ambassadors and teach and share these truths that you have convinced us and taught us through your spirit, that we would be able to sit down with people and say, hey, listen, it's so clear here. Why do we as mankind want to do the opposite of what God tells us? Lord, I pray, make us evangelists, Lord. Help us take the word out, both of encouragement and truth, Lord. Help us share that. And again, Lord, as we started off our service, Lord, if you send us to Ukraine, <laughs> help us to be willing to go. Or if you bring Ukrainians here, help us to practice our gifts of hospitality. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.